And we're going to start this morning in the book of Acts, chapter 13. If you all want to turn with me there this morning. God is good, right? All the time. Amen? God is so good. I'm thankful for his great love and all the things that he accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. <coughs> I'm thankful that he so loved us. Amen? That he gave. Praise God. <laughs> Acts, chapter 13. And we'll start in verse 13. I'm going to read just a little bit here. We're going to find out what's going on. And it says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Pambos, or from suffering, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. All right. So he's, then Paul says in verse 16, he says, he said, Paul stood up and beckoning with his right, with his hand, said, Men of Israel, ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought he them out of it. And he goes on about the time of 40 years. He suffered their manners in the wilderness. And he goes on, but I want to kind of skip on down here. Um, and let's go to, uh, let's go to verse, uh, let's go to verse 26. He says, men and brethren, this is where he's gotten into his, his uh, exhortation there. He said, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. All right. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God, but God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them, which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, all right, now, there was a promise made to the fathers. If you go back into Genesis, we find in Genesis chapter 3 that, hey, they've partaken of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, all right? And, and God promises them something, okay? In, in the judgment, he also promises them hope, a light, amen? And I'm just going to read that to you. Genesis chapter 3. And this is his, and God judges, it's verse 14. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, I'm not going to go into all that meaning of all those things, but he says in verse 15, this is the promise. This is uh, the encouragement here. And he says, I will put enmity, all right, that's a, that means reason for separation between thee and the woman, between thee and the church, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, what's he talking about here? He's, he's already right here promising us salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The seed shall bruise thy head the head of the serpent, and thou, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. Okay, or it also speaks of the rear of an army, but it's telling us about Jesus. All right, this is a promise made unto the people that it will not always be in bondage. What does he tell us? He tells us that, amen, that where are our enemies supposed to be? Under the soles of our feet, right? He tells us in Joshua chapter 1 that every, wherever, so ever we choose to place the soles of our feet, that's 
ours to have, right? That land is ours. It's a promise that God has given us that wherever we choose by faith to walk in his promised land or in this land right here, this is the land he's promised us. He promises eternal, everlasting life, right? This is the land. Back then it was a natural land. Here it is this land right here. But he's already went through the land. And he already defeated every giant in this land. Amen. Every enemy. We find in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, even the last enemy, which was death. Enemy is, uh, the enemy is, uh, uh, death is an enemy. And it was the last one. He overcame that when he rose victorious from the grave. So he's already went through this land. And he says, now then you can walk in the land. Now then you can possess the land. You do it by faith, don't you? Each step we take in him is by faith. Because we, we don't see him, right, as far as a natural uh, apparition of him. But we find that we walk by faith, right? By faith. And so we find that he's promised him here in Genesis that you're not always going to be defeated. You're not always going to be um, in, you know, serpent bit or whatever, you know, you want to call it. We're going to go into all that but later. But he talks about being victorious here. All right. He talks about there no longer being any condemnation. And we sang that in one of the songs this morning. About I think it was the second one we sang. But so I want you to see here. He's made promises to the fathers. And he says in verse 33, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. All right. This day have I begotten thee. All right. If we look in First Peter 1. All right. Let's just turn there right quick. He's begotten Jesus, right? Raised him again. All right. First Peter 1. And verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, oh, that, we're going to go back to that word mercy here in a minute, hath begotten us again into a lively, life-giving, life-quickening hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Woo! I know the book of Ephesians says when he raised him up, he raised us up also. In another place, he says he raised us up and placed us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, right? All right. He's begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To what? An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that it fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, the heaven just speaks of the abode of God. Where does he live? Where does he? Colossians tells us. We are the temple. Well, Colossians says that, you know, he's in us. But uh, but anyway, the mystery that's been hid from the age is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's basically how it works. But he tells us we're the temple, amen, we're the abode of God. He's living in his house, amen. Um, if we turn to uh, verse 23, same chapter, he talks about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. What makes us incorruptible? The word of God. The more we put in. Amen. <laughs> We're getting rid of that incorruption. Get rid of that corruption. All right. But being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All right. So I want you to see here. He has begotten Jesus again. All right. Verse 33 of Acts chapter 13. But he tells us in Peter, he's begotten us again into that lively hope in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our hope. All right, by the word of God, we've been born again, amen, or we have been begotten again, okay? So we see all these things here, all right? So he goes on and he says, now, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, all right? 
Now he raised him up not to return to corruption. So when he raised us up, does he, can, does he want us to be in corruption or decay? No. He raised him up. All right, let's just read it. As concerning that he raised him up from the dead. I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, no more to return to corruption. He said that on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now, we just read over in um, Peter about the mercy, right? According to his abundant mercy. All right. I'll give you the sure mercies of David. And what he's basically talking about here, he's, it's the promise of Jesus Christ who is merciful, amen? We find our mercy in him. The type and shadow is the, you know, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat, and the, amen? So we find these things. I'm going to give you the sure mercies of David. We find that the mercies endure forever, amen? His mercies are new every morning, and we can quote several scriptures about his mercy, how it never ends, it never runs out, right? It's ever abiding. It's always with us, amen? So he gives you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he said also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, all right, for David after that he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was led into his fathers and saw corruption. Okay. But he, but he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Hallelujah. Right? Praise God. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, all right, through this man, Jesus Christ, unto you the forgiveness of sins. Through this man, through Jesus Christ, amen, we have been preached the forgiveness of sins. No more condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, right? Romans 8. So he says, the forgiveness of sins, all right? And, and by him, by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So we have been justified through Christ Jesus. Amen. We have been justified. Now, what is justified? Justified is the exact opposite of condemnation. Exact opposite. It, it means that you are now holy, unblameable, unreprovable. You're righteous. Amen. We are the slates clean. The blackboard's been erased. I mean, all the, all the things that were against us because of the sin issue have been wiped away. And they have no legal right to affect us or harm us or intimidate us. Amen? Amen. Because we are justified. All right? Because we couldn't be justified under the law of Moses. Jesus Christ came. We know that he fulfilled that old law of sin and death that kept us at a certain level. We could no rise no higher. But how many know he fulfilled that old law? Every jot and every tittle of that old law, he fulfilled it. And then what did he do? He raised us up and placed us in his high law, the law of life in Christ Jesus. So now we have a right to live. Amen. He says in, in another place in Romans, I believe it's Romans chapter 5, where he talks about that he has given us a gift, a gift of righteousness. All right. And that right relationship with the Father. All right. And he talks about justification unto life. Justification unto life. In other words, that means that we have the right and the ability to live. Woo, we have the right, the legal right, and the legal ability to live because of what Jesus Christ did. Amen? All right. So he has already justified us from all things. All right. I'm going to read on down. I'm going to go on over because he goes on, um, beware, let's uh, the things that the prophets have talked about come upon you, despisers, wonder, perish. But he goes on in verse 
Um, verse 46. No, that's verse four, back up to 45. Um, verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear what? The word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, all right, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary, bless you, Pastor G. It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, the Jews, to whom the oracles of God were given. Okay? But, but, seeing you put it from you, they put the word from them. They didn't want to come close to God. They wanted to do their own thing. What did they do when Jesus, they, they said, crucify him. Remember, Jesus was the word made flesh, right? In John, it tells us he was the word made flesh. And he, he dwelt among us. They put him away. Crucify him. We don't want anything to do with him. Just crucify him. Give us Barabbas. We'll take that thief, but just crucify Jesus. We don't want him. We, li we, like, the, we like our darkness. <laughs> Amen? They didn't want Jesus. They, they, I mean, he would, he, remember, they wanted to stone him in one place. You know, they were, he was always making them mad because they had their religion, amen, and they thought it had to be according to the law of Moses. Remember, they said, well, Moses is our father. What are you talking about? Moses is our father. They didn't want to come out from under that old law of religion, amen. They wanted to, to stay there and do things their own way, amen. Yeah, amen. So one thing that got them in trouble then is they put it, put the word from them. They put Jesus out. They put they didn't want to hear the word. Amen. They were afraid of God. They didn't want to hear it. But he says, and also, now this is the next thing. I wanted this is what I wanted to look at. But he says, and you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Whew. Wow. They judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life. They judged themselves undeserving, all right? Uh, unsuitable, all right? They, they, you, we could say it in, in one place, uh, common. They wanted to be like the Gentiles, didn't they? How many times did they want a king? Remember, they wanted a king just like the other nations. Give us a king, you know. We don't want to be... We don't want you to be our king. We want to have a king just like the other nations. You know, let us go back to Egypt where we had the leeks and the garlic. <laughs> they wanted to stay in that, didn't they? It went against their religion. It, it, cha it, it, it challenged their, <laughs> their thoughts. They didn't want to change. But they, they counted themselves unworthy, undeserving, unsuitable, common. Amen. How many know when Peter, remember in, in, in the book of, what's here in the book of Acts, when Peter went to uh, Cornelius' house, remember before he went there, we find that Peter was on top of the rooftop, and we had this sheet come down, and it came down, and it opened up, and it had all manner of unclean animals in there, and God says, that Peter, rise and eat. And Peter says, but, oh, but God, I can't. Those, those are unclean animals. And I've never tasted of the unclean animals. Not, it's not lawful for me to do. So she would go up. And the second time it would come down and open up. And God would say, Peter, rise and eat. And Peter said, I, but God, I can't. That, that, that's unclean animals. And it's not right for a Jew. Me being a Jew, I shouldn't do that. That's not right. Mm. She would go up. Third time it would come down. Peter, rise and eat. And Peter's like, well, but Lord, I can't. That's unlawful for me to do. I'm a Jew. But what did God say? He says, don't call what I've cleaned unclean. Don't call it common. Don't call it like the Gentiles, like everybody else. And then what, did, what was he getting him ready for? He was getting him ready to go to the Gentiles, to Cornelius' house, a centurion. 
to go and to bring salvation unto the Gentiles. He's saying now, anyone that believes in Jesus is no longer common like the Gentiles, no longer unclean, no longer just like everybody else. Now you're extraordinary. You're above. All right, you're in Christ. All right, you're righteous, holy. Un Colossians says unreprovable, unblameable, and holy. Amen? We're holy. Be holy even as I am holy, right? So they had a problem here. They put the word from him, and then in their minds, in their minds, they wasn't worthy. They wasn't worthy of being like Christ. They weren't worthy of the word. They wasn't worthy of God. We'll just do our own thing. We don't want a part of that. We we're unsuitable for that. But remember when they were back at, at Mount Sinai and they said, oh, Moses, you go talk to God. We're just going to back up way over here and you just don't know what he says. And, uh, you know, we, we'll do whatever he says, but we just don't want to have anything to do with him. We're scared. <laughs> there was no relationship there. But you see what I'm saying? How many times do we in our lives, and don't raise your hand. This is just for us to examine ourselves. How many times do we think, oh, I'm just not not good enough. <laughs> they get up in front of everybody and preach. Can't do that. <laughs> I'm thankful I can't. Thankful is him, right? <laughs> but all he's looking for is willing hearts, willing vessels. Amen. Amen. But we've got to understand that we've got to quit looking at ourselves as common. Amen? We've got to quit looking at ourselves like the rest of the nations. Don't think that we're not suitable or we're not good enough. God says we got to judge as he judges. Amen? And he says we're holy. Unblameable. Unreprovable. Amen? We're righteous. We gotta, we gotta act like that and believe that. Convince ourselves of that. That no matter what we feel like, or we sometimes we feel like we're just a, you know, an accident waiting to happen, or a sad sack on the way to Baghdad, or something. You know what I mean? We we get the we feel like that sometimes, don't we? Especially if we're having a bad day, or somebody criticizes us, or you know, different things go on in the world, and we kind of let things affect us don't we but we have to as David did grab a hold of the ephod grab a hold of this word amen because what did he say did the work amen what did he say we got them the word of God begot us amen over in Peter we're begotten again by the word of God amen so the more the word of God we put in the less that the world worldly words are going to hurt us or affect us amen okay so what i want you to see we got to quit thinking uh, uh, let's look at psalms 82 let's just go back over here psalm 82 go back further we've read this before but i'll read it again remind you uh, psalm 82 and uh, verse 1 god standeth in the congregation, or stands, basically positions himself, uh, to positions oneself in the congregation of the mighty, which is the holy, all right, the holy ones, uh, the living great. He judgeth among the gods, okay? He judgeth among the, the mighty, the gods, amen? Now, who's he talking about? And then he says in verse 2, he says, how long will you judge so it's a different judgment here than what God's judgment was. God judges among the gods, okay? But how long will you judge unjustly or unworthy? How long will you believe that? How long will you accept the persons of the wicked or the morally wrong or the unrighteousness? How many, how long will we Think of ourselves as separate from God, 
lower than, less than, uh, and, uh, separated from him. What are all the words I'm looking for? How, many, how, many, how, how long are we going to continue to think this way? Because what, what does it lead to? Let's look. He says in verse 3, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and all of the foundations are, of the earth are out of course. I have said, now this is God's judgment, okay? Verse 1 said he judges, all right? This is his judgment. He said, I have said, you are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. Now, when he says God, he's not saying God's separate, separate from him. Amen? It's being one with him. All right? But this is what he said. You are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. But, in verse 7, you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Why? Because they continue to think of themselves unjustly or unworthy, unsuitable. I can't do this or I can't be. I can't, I can't, I can't. No. We have to identify with him, with Christ, with, the, with God, amen, with Jesus Christ. We have to identify with who and what he is because he has, New Testament, he has already reconciled us back to himself. Right? Made us one with him. Jesus said, Father, make them one even as we are one. It's his desire, his plan, his purpose for us to be one with him, to manifest his true life in this earth. Amen? So we find here, he says, you are God's. But if you want to take the, out, the y R out of there, you can put you gods. You gods. <laughs> All of you children of the Most High. Amen. This is who we are. This is his judgment. That's who we are. Amen. Don't we got to quit thinking of ourselves as common, unclean, separate from God. Um, we got to con continue to convince ourselves as David grabbed a hold, like I say, of the ephod and encouraged himself. This is how we keep ourselves encouraged and strengthened. Amen. By reading the word. Um, we could go to Acts chapter 2. All right. Let's, um, uh, let's see. We'll go back to Acts here. And then just look for a minute. Um, talk just for a minute. Because he says um, in, verse, in chapter 13 where we were reading, talks about unworthy of what? Of what? What were we unworthy of? Everlasting life is what they, they, and people tend to think themselves unworthy of everlasting life. That's what got the Jews in trouble, all right? God's chosen people was they did not believe themselves worthy of everlasting life. Now, that everlasting means perpetual, okay? It's 166 in your concordance. It means perpetual. Um, it means uh, to judge yourself uh like I say, everlasting and, and eternal is basically what it talks about. And life is that Zoe life. It's 22, 22. Uh, life in the spirit and soul. Zoe represents the highest and best which Christ is. All right. And which he gives to the saints. It's the highest blessedness of the creature. That's the everlasting life. And he has promised that to us. But what do we got to do? Okay. In Acts chapter 2. Let's back that up to chapter 2. Let's look at some examples here. Acts chapter 2. Went too far. Acts chapter 2. Okay. All right. We find um, in verse 24. All right. He's talking about Jesus here. Peter's talking his sermon They've just received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and Peter's sermon is going to be going on right here. But he says, he's talking about Jesus. Uh, talking in verse 24, Him being delivered by determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, 
having loosed the pains of death, whoo, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay? Uh, let's look in verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, Wherefore, we are all witnesses, all right? Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, and he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. So we see God raised up Jesus, right? The man Jesus, all right? He raised him up as the man, okay? Jesus Christ, all right? Now turn with me uh, to Acts chapter 10. Okay, Acts chapter 10, verse 40, I believe it is. Let me see. Acts chapter 10. Uh, all right, and he says, And him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. All right. Not to all the people, but to the witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he, after he, after he. What did he do? What did Jesus do after he rose from the dead? Okay, after he rose from the dead. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll start in verse 13 because that's a new thought there. But he says, But I would not have you bre ignorant, brethren, verse 13, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So Jesus died and Jesus rose again again all right could we say that god raised and we see jesus as the man and that jesus rose as god does that make sense but jesus raised up what i'm trying to say here okay um he raised him up jesus, god has raised us up and and see this in the heavenly places he hath begotten us again into a lively hope. But then he goes on and tells us, Now then, you arise. Isaiah, I believe it's 52. He says, Arise, arise. You put on your beautiful garments. All right, let's just look at that. I want to look at that. It's in Isaiah. I believe it's chapter 52. Let's see if I can show you what I'm trying to say here. Because I want us to see something here. Isaiah 52, yes. He says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Now, who's he telling to put their strength on? Zion, right? He's not saying he's doing it. He says, you put it on. Put on your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city. Hello, Zion. Hello, Jerusalem. All right. For henceforth there shall no more come to thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money now do you see how he's telling us to do something right zion is the highest order jerusalem speaks of peace it's the city of the living god right zion is where the city is all right okay so we find here he's telling us to do something you arise you put on your garments all right you put on your strength all right shake the dust off okay arise 
into your rightful position in God, one with him, and the understanding and knowledge of who you are, and sit down in, your, in the throne room with Christ. Because he says in, in Revelation, the book of Revelation, what did Jesus say? To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I'm seated in the throne with the Father. To him that overcomes. So we've got to rise up to overcome, right? We've got to rise up, okay? In one place in the book of Psalms, it says, And he, God, clothed himself with strength, Ooh, with righteousness. He clothed himself. So if you can see what I'm trying to say, he's telling us, okay, Jesus had to do it. I raised him up, and then he raised, not two separate, he raised up, okay? He raised up. I'm saying God raised us up and placed us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, let's look at that. That's just what I'm talking about right here. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And, and Paul praying here. He's, um, well, let's just start in chapter 1 because it, it all connects right back and forth here. Chapter 1 of Ephesians. Uh, he's praying. He says, um, which way far back do I want to go? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, in whom we have, uh, verse 7 says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Okay. Uh, he says, I see, in verse 16, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of, Woo, over and above. Woo, greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And we could go right on over into chapter 2. He says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And he says in verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, there's that word again, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath, past tense, hath already raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So he's already raised up Jesus. He's already raised us up and placed us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All right? He's already placed us in that high law which speaks of life in Christ Jesus, not death. That was the old law. All right? Then we find that when he raised him up, he raised us up, right? Together. Okay? With the body of Christ. When the head raises up, I mean, no, nature tells you the rest of the body raises up too, right? It, 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 take it in the natural, take it in the spiritual. He's saying he's already raised us up. He already raised up Jesus Christ, okay? And then he turned around in First Thessalonians. We find that he rose. It's, that's anastemi, all right? And that is uh, to stand upright, okay? To raise up. I mean, no, we, we talked before about the word resurrection. And we, we are taught that that's the that body raising up. And, okay, yes, maybe. But if you look at it a little deeper, okay, the real meaning of resurrection is to bring back to assurance of right action. To bring back 
to a moral righteousness, that, that true righteousness that God is, to bring us back into the true life of the living God. Right? Okay. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life in Christ. Amen. We're made alive. All right. That, that's that lively hope that he talked about in First Peter. All right. So what I'm wanting you to see here, uh, like I say, it says in the psalm that God clothed himself with strength with righteousness and all these things so um let, let's let's look at it this way okay how many remember the, the in the book of acts there again acts has got some tremendous stories in it but how many remember the man setting he was he was lame from his birth and he was sitting at the gate of the temple the temple beautiful and he was sitting there and he was asking alms of everyone that came along and you know i need some money you know i've got to eat you know and this is how he you know ate and everything because he didn't really couldn't walk but he would ask alms, and we find that Peter and John came along. And it says that he looked at them expecting something. And Peter says, you know, I don't have much to give you, but what I do have, I'm going to speak it. And he says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Well, that man jumped up. It said he leaped up, and he walked, and he leaped, and he was praising God. But what did it take to get to that point? When Peter said that, when Peter said rise and walk, did he have to rise up? No, he did not have to, did he? He could have chose unbelief, and he could have stayed in the place he was at. But he had faith to believe, and he got up, and he began dancing and leaping and praising God, and they went into the tabernacle, into the temple, and they began, amen, to exhort God. And we find then he had to have faith to do it, didn't he? What about the man at the pool? Siloam, here again in the facts again, Woo good book <laughs> but we find there's a man and he's been lame for years and years and he's been laying at the pool of siloam at, he was going to remember the pool that's where they're going to the, every time there's a moving of the waters or the angel moves the waters the first person to get in gets healed remember that story okay so that's what we're looking at this man laid there though for years and years and when jesus came along he said would you like to be healed he says, uh, well, I just don't have anybody to get me into the water. Every time I get to get up and go, the, you know, get to move that way, there's somebody gets in before me, and I, I just can't get healed. I can't get there. And Jesus said, take up your bed. He said, arise, take up your bed and walk. And he did. He took up his bed. And remember the, oh, the uh, name gainsayers, the Philistines and all them? They're like, oh, not Philistines, <laughs> Pharisees. <laughs> but they say, what are you doing carrying your bed? It's the Sabbath day. And now he begins, they begin to condemn him, right? But Jesus said, rise up, take up your bed and walk. It took faith, didn't it? It took faith to take up his bed and walk. It didn't just, God didn't just yank him up and make him walk. He had to do something. When he was told, arise, he had to do something about it. He had to either believe or not believe. And he chose to believe. All right? We can find many other stories in the Bible of different ones that had to rise up when they were told to rise up. I meant Lazarus. We could look at Lazarus. And, and, and Jesus called him forth, didn't he? He said, come out of there, Lazarus. Got to rise up out of there. But we find these stories are telling us something. They're telling us that those that were spoken to had to do something with what they were told. Uh-huh. Just like we found in Isaiah 52, arise, arise, put on your strength, O Zion, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, do something, is what they're saying. We, we could look at uh, Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord is where? It's risen upon you, but you got to arise, and you got to shine, <laughs> Amen. All right, I want you to see these things. We, we could read in uh, 1 Corinthians where he talks about this corruptible. What does he do? He must put on. Oh, put on indicates to me something needs to be done, right? Just like he said in Isaiah 52. Put on your strength. Put on your beautiful garments, right? But he says this corruptible must put on incorruption, so we have to do something, right? This mortal must 
put on immortality. Oh, so something's got to be done, right? There shall then there shall come to pass the saying, "Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, you know, where's your sting? Where's all these things? How, how you can't even affect them anymore, right?" That's I'm not sure if I'm quoting that. Just right. he says, "Oh, grave, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting?" Oh, yeah. So anyway, we find then that. We have to do something with what we hear, right? Be you a doer of the word, not just a hearer only, right? <laughs> so what do we do? We talked about being begotten again. You see, we're begotten by the word of God. And that word of God quickens this mortal body, amen? It quickens our mind, amen? That word of God resurrects us, causes us to be begotten or born again, amen? Amen. So we got to speak to these tabernacles. We got to speak to this house. I mean, we got to talk to this house. Amen. Um, Ephesians 5. Oh, I read. No, I didn't read that. If I just, Ephesians 5, I read too. So Ephesians 5 and verse 14. He says, therefore, awake thou that sleepest and do what? Arise from the dead. Woo! We got to do something, don't we? we got to do something. Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Oh, you see that? Stand upright. We have to convince ourselves who we really, truly really are. We are the mighty ones he talks about. We are the ones, the gods he's talking about. We're actually one with him, all right? Not separate from him. One with him. John chapter 5. All right, John chapter 5. And verse 25. Let's look, let's see what that says right quick. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment, and because he is the Son of Man. All right? So he goes on, and he's talking about being one with him. You can read all that down there. But he's, he's saying to us, we can arise. We can rise up. Amen. And we can manifest the true identity, the true life. Amen. That we really, truly are in Christ Jesus. Okay. He raised up Jesus from the dead. And then Jesus raised up from the dead. He raised us up from the dead. Now we have to raise ourselves up. Amen. Raise ourselves up to believe that we are the overcomers he's called us to be. We are already one in Christ Jesus. He already lives. Behold, I show you a mystery. It's Christ in you. The true life, the true living life. The eternal, everlasting, immortal, limitless life is already inside of us. Woo! He's already in his house already in his temple and he is you know the bible says my god shall 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 supply all of my need absolutely but i like to say my god is supplying all of my need who put it in the right now my god is supplying my need all of my need <coughs> all right he's that constant flow of life supply in this temple in this house amen i thank you lord jesus for the victory in everything who right God always causes us to triumph. He always gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. Amen. He's already defeated every enemy, even the last enemy, which is death. I praise God. He's already defeated every enemy. And all we have to do is choose by faith to rise up, believe who we are, and walk in the land. Possess it. It's ours to have. That's our inheritance. Amen. Praise God. God is good all the time. Amen. And all the time.
God is good. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Well, I'm just going to say that I'm so glad um, for everyone that could join us today here at the church or in on YouTube, wherever. We're so glad you could join us today, and uh, we would like to invite you uh, to join us here at Redemption Life Center. Um, we are located here in Catoosa, Oklahoma. Uh, we're located at 28906 East Admiral Place, Catoosa, Oklahoma. And our service times are Sunday at 30 a.m. and on Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. All right. And we also would like to invite you to team up with us in sending out our messages into YouTube or to get copies of our messages also if you wanted to. Uh, you can mail donations to Redemption Life Center, care of P.O. Box 1304, Catoosa, Oklahoma, 74015. And may God richly bless each and every one of you and hope that you can continue to join us, all right, as we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>